privilege. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just real quick, um, I just wrote a book. <laughs> and um, it actually isn't out yet. It only comes out in August. Um, the book is all about the encounter that I had with the Holy Spirit. The first three chapters are kind of the story of the encounter and leading up to it. And then the next, I don't know uh, how many chapters, eight chapters, I'm doing math in my head, are what the Lord taught me over the three years of stewarding that encounter. Um, because how many of you know that an encounter is just the beginning of discovery? And that encounter is an, actually an open door to invitation, to learning about things of the Lord that you don't know yet. And to be quite frank, even today I'll be teaching out of something that only in the last probably eight months the Lord has opened the door to. And it actually all was from that encounter three and a half years ago. But he is still teaching me further. And so the book is called Surrender to the Holy Spirit. Um, and actually this little dove over here, uh, Mike Buss, who is my PA and pastor in third year and creative extraordinaire, uh, grabbed a hold of this and designed it with one of our close friends. So Mike Buss, would you just stand up? Can we just honor Michael Buss? <laughs> Michael has served me for the last three years. Uh, he's a highly talented young man. Uh, grew up in pastoral ministry with his parents, but has given the last three years of his life to really just serve what God is doing in my life and honestly just be on a journey with me as I've grown. Uh, hate to break it to you all, but when God calls you, he doesn't make you perfect. He takes you as you are and then he grows you. And growth, the growth zone is a pain zone. Uh, the growth zone is the challenge zone. The comfort zone is called the comfort zone for a reason, but there's no growth in the comfort zone. And um, this young man has uh, stepped into that and supported me and he loves my family. He's an uncle to my children, a friend to my husband and I'm just really grateful for him. And I do, I honor him for flying across the world just to sit on a front row to support me. So thanks, Mike. Anyway, the book arrived early and so I brought two boxes thinking, oh, maybe I'll just you know, bring some books. We'll see, maybe someone will buy them. Well, it turns out you bought them before we even started the first session. So thanks, Australia. But I kept one to give away. And um, actually, even if you do own it already, I, I'm so sorry, I cannot remember your name. Don, Don? Um, I really felt, just I was praying about who to give this to, I was gonna do someone's birthday, but I immediately felt the Lord say to give this book to you. And um, I feel like you are, you are in this season of radical encounter that you've stepped out on the water, that you have taken a great risk, and you have been like Peter, and you've stepped out on the water with the Lord, and he is building a man in this season. You went to go build a ministry, but the Lord is building a man, and the Lord is building a man who will bring light into the darkness, and will bring the, the power of God where people think that it's form. And uh, Don, we just honor your life, we honor your yes. I, do you have a family? Yeah, honor your family, kids? Two, three. Yeah, thanks, Holy Spirit. I just, I just see, do you have a daughter? Yeah, I see this uh, little girl. I see freedom on her life. I see a, the liberty bell. I see her ringing the liberty bell as she moves in the Lord. And I see, um, I, I see the angel armies actually move as she moves. And I feel like as you have moved into this new season as a family, you're gonna experience angelic activity like never before. In Acts 2, two things that happened was wind and fire. And in Hebrews and in Psalms, it talks about he makes his spirits like wind and like fire, which means where the presence of the Holy Spirit is, so are the angel armies. And I just believe you're gonna experience radical outpouring of the Spirit, but you'll also experience a vast angel army to support you for where sin abounds, grace abounds even more so. And as you stepped into a dark place, the Lord is illuminating his great light in a city. St. Francis, a city, I just see a St. Francis. I think you just planted a church in San Fran, if I can remember correctly. And I just see, um, see where the darkness has abounded. You see many people, they prophesy darkness, but what they don't realize is God meets darkness with a greater measure of himself. And so Don, God is about to meet your family with a greater measure of himself. You have been born to walk into the river of God and to create a river in a city. 
And um, I just bless the wells of revivals in San Francisco. Keep hope in San Francisco, a free city, a free nation. And so goes California, so goes America. And so we just release the power and the presence of God into you and your family. And we bless you in Jesus' name. I'm not gonna make him get up because God's touching him. And that's holy. Manifestations are holy. God is holy. Um, I was praying and asking the Lord what to say. You know, sometimes you, you come to conferences and I, I, I tell you the truth. I, I preach a lot more than I ever did, probably starting a, just over a year ago. My preaching schedule just, I don't know, just took off or something. I think in, I had a span of 35 days where I spoke 36 times. Uh, and in those seasons, you kind of wonder if you're ever gonna run out of messages, um, especially when you weren't prepared for it. But then you come here and you step into an open heaven and all of a sudden you're like, what do I say? Because I wanna say everything all at once. Because what God is doing here is not, uh, it's not typical. It's not normal. It should be. It should be the normal Christian life, but unfortunately, um, we have tamed the Lord to a kitty cat. We have taken the lion of the tribe of Judah and we have framed in him in something safe, something comfortable, and we have framed kindness and love into something palatable. And um, and we have almost uh, by accident. I don't think anyone's done it on purpose, but we have framed God into the understanding of man. The problem is man didn't make God, God made man. Man made every other religion. I said this, every man made religion, man formed that God. Man formed him by their logic, by their psyche, by what they would expect, by what they would think. So you do good and then you will come out in the next life as good, right? Because that makes sense. Good people get good things. The problem is, is man didn't make this God we serve. This God that we serve was here before the beginning of time, was bef here before the world was ever born. He birthed the world and he birthed your life. And um, as I was praying into this session, I feel to kind of carry, it's a prophetic message, but it is also a message. So I'm not just gonna prophesy today, but I want you to hear this message as a prophetic word. Um, I believe that we are in an hour where the Lord is gonna bring the balance of scales into society and uh, I think you know, when you look at the previous moves of God, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Toronto Revival in Toronto Airport, Canada, the Brownsville Revival on the East Coast, the Pensacola Revival. In the 90s, there was this wild move of the Spirit. Listen, I'm from a Methodist church in South Africa. I went from a Methodist church to a charismatic church called Bethel Church, bless the Lord. I mean, you wanna go from extremes. But actually, the truth is that in our Methodist church, there was a move of God. I didn't know it then. I was eight years old when Toronto was booming. And these guys from Toronto, Canada showed up at our church. They weren't allowed to preach, but they were invited to pray for whoever was hungry at the end. And there was about eight of us that were lined up. I was eight years old. I remember I was wearing green sweatpants and a, and a pink like fleece top. And I thought that they didn't match properly. And I thought these men of God are about to pray for me and my clothes don't match. <laughs> Little eight-year-old brain. Uh, but I remember my whole family, five of us lined up and then I think two or three other leaders of the church. You see, my parents had experienced the move of God in their 20s, but what often happens is we have these blips on the radar, but we don't know how to sustain it. And so in this time of the 90s revival, our Methodist church was experiencing the overflow of revival. And... Um, my parents actually paid a great price. I, I see that now, I didn't know that then. And they had paid a great price for our Sunday evening services. Mornings were your typical Methodist services, but our Sunday evenings, there was a one man, his name was Andrew Binning, he's about six foot four. He would run around with a whistle in his mouth and blow up what we called a praise whistle, while I would do conga lines around the church singing, we are marching in the light of God. Anyone, we are marching in the light of God, yeah. We are marching, we are marching. Whoa, where are you guys? <laughs> you gotta, whoa. Listen, I was a pastor's kid. I was called up on stage to do actions for songs that didn't even have actions. 
You're 16, you're trying to be cool, you know, your friends are all there, and your mom's like, hey, Haley's gonna come up and do actions for the song. And I'm like, I think, I'm like, mom, there's no actions for the song. So you're just like, this, a lot of this, a lot of big arm movements. <laughs> My dad was notorious for a time of sharing, but the problem is nobody wanted to share except the people that shouldn't share. I remember one time a man started talking about circumcision and started unbuttoning his shirt. And I've never seen my father, he never panics. I've, I've never seen him run so fast across the platform. But he was just about to show us a shoulder surgery, but we didn't know, we weren't sure. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, that'll get you nervous. I've got worse stories. I've got worse stories that I'm gonna keep uh, away from you for the sake of your own sanity. But frequently in these times of sharing, if no one would come up on stage, my father would say, Haley is gonna come and share something. <laughs> oh, is she? <laughs> he would tell stories that happened at home and he would get them completely wrong and totally embarrass me. I was like, that was totally Allison, my sister, because she has no filter and says everything. I'm like, I did not talk about that at home. But anyway, this was my life. And um, in this Methodist church, even though we weren't pursuing revival, we were experiencing the overflow of revival. And the truth is that the church across the world has experienced a measure of the outpouring because of that revival in the 90s. And that revival was birthed because the church was dwindling and dying. People were doing church growth seminars. Those were the big things to do. Find the form, find the format, find out how to get people, how to get butts in seats. Why? Because you can't do your payroll unless you got people tithing. And so the church is in the middle of these growth seminars and some guys get fed up. Really, Randy Clark got fed up. A man by Dr. Clark, and he goes, and he goes and finds a man called Rodney Howard Brown, born in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, my claim to fame. And Randy Clark follows Rodney Howard Brown around a meeting, and he gets Rodney to pray for him over six times. Does whatever. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know what he's doing. He just knows he cannot live in form. And Dr. Clark gets touched by Rodney, gets prayed for six times, goes to a little vineyard pastor's meeting where everybody is burnt out, tired, exhausted. Why? Because when the spirit doesn't move, we have to flow on the power of the gift. Your gifts are irrevocable. Romans 11, 29 says that your gifts are irrevocable, which means they flow and move without the anointing sometimes. Oh, that's why people are influential. That's a gift. That's why people can be prophetic without being connected to the Lord. Why? Because God gives gifts for free because he's a good dad. But it's like running on battery life. Eventually, battery life goes out. But when you connect it to the Spirit, it's like being plugged into the socket. And Dr. Clark goes to a meeting with tired pastors, and he takes a risk. And in that meeting, God starts to move for the first time in a long time. And there are two people, John and Carol Arnott, that invite Dr. Clark to their church, to Toronto, to do an, a meeting there. And in that meeting, what happened in that small room breaks out in the church and Randy Clark stays there for weeks while they steward a move of God. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because in the 90s, the message of the goodness of God started to be uh, spread far and wide. All of a sudden, a God that was stoic, that was sitting up in heaven with a clipboard marking us wrong or right, got shifted into the real image of a God, of a good father. And the goodness of God has been carried on the wave of that revival. But what we're seeing now is we're seeing as human beings grab a hold of the message of the goodness of God, we have lost the tension of His holiness. Now the challenge is the message of the goodness of God is not supposed to die with the message of the holiness of God. And what we've seen is we've seen this pendulum swing from one thing to the next. And I believe the key for this next season, for this next generation, is to be able to walk in the tension of the nature and the ways of God without needing to swing one way or the other. And the only way that you can do that is not going to be through form. It will be through following the Spirit. I preached yesterday about surrendering to the Spirit. I want you to open up to John 15. This is such a well-known passage. Thank you. I can feel the Lord moving. Can you feel Him moving? I can feel the manifestation of the Spirit of revelation today. 
in uh, Isaiah 11, it says that the spirit of wisdom, of revelation, of counsel, and of might, of knowledge, and of fear of the Lord will rest upon what? The shoot that will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesus, the shoot that will come up. And it says, and in the fear of the Lord, he will take delight. And um, a lot of people, we don't want to talk about the fear of the Lord because we've acquainted the fear of the Lord to the fear of the enemy, to a unholy fear. But there is a godly fear. You could feel it last night when Ben Fitz was sharing. But it makes the church uncomfortable. Why? Because we have so clung to the goodness of God that we have forgot that there's a terrifying nature about Him. And if God is not terrifying, our sin has nothing to be afraid of. If God is not terrifying, your shame has nothing to flee from. If God is not terrifying and all-powerful, then the assault and the assignment against your life has every reason to stay. And if we do not embrace both the goodness of God and the fear of the Lord, what happens is we begin to live a very weak, weak Christian life where we begin to grab hold of man-made tools to try and attack the, the hard things in our lives because we do not think God is big enough. We shrink God down to the size of what we can hold and host instead of letting Him overwhelm us. And the life saturated with the Spirit is not just a life filled with the Spirit, but a life filled with the Spirit becomes a life that gets hidden in God. Let's read John 15 before I get ahead of myself. Let's go verse three. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, um, it is that that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The root word of that word nothing is nothing. Nothing. I think that that word nothing, obviously you're doing something right now, even if you're not abiding in God, but you can do nothing of eternal significance. We are not building a legacy for tomorrow. We are building a legacy for a generation we have not yet seen because we are eternal beings. And this passage here, what's really interesting is often we read the Bible in very small contextual. So we'll look at this and we'll think, okay, I must abide in God and and He in me and I will bear much fruit, which means I need to be connected to the Lord. Yay, I'm a Christian. But what we don't realize is actually the context of John 15 is in a bigger context and it's actually in the context of the coming of the Spirit. John 13, Jesus is having His final dinner with His disciples and He's saying, I'm going. And they are like, whoa, 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 which is so crazy, actually, because Mary is preparing him for burial, but the people that are with him, they are going, Mary, what are you doing pouring out oil on his feet? Mary's the only one that gets it, that he's going. The disciples are still clinging to this idea that Jesus is going to overthrow the Roman government and they're going to be rulers. They're literally squabbling among each other, like, listen, where are you going to sit? Some of us, some of it's heaven, but some of them are like, listen, what, what posse are you going to take, you know? Who's the greatest? Because Jesus is going to take, sit on the throne, not the throne of, they're not thinking kingdom, they're thinking the throne of the world, going to take over the Romans, and then we're going to rule. And Mary's figured it out. And here, Jesus is promising in John 14, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, for I will come to you. He says he will send a paraclete, a comforter, a helper, the one who will come alongside. I said this yesterday. But in the context of the coming of the Spirit, Jesus begins to preach a message of abiding. This is the first time in all of history that men will not have to wait for God to stand beside him, that God will not just fill them, but now they can hide in God. And I, uh, the first part of stewarding my encounter was learning I am the temple and God fills me. But I got a word, I got a word in the midst of this stewardship of encounter from David Wagner, a prophet in America, and he said to me, Haley, you are gonna hide in the heart of God 
and you're going to come out and speak a message and you're going to go back in. In fact, in, uh, in 1 Samuel 2, it talks about this prophet that the Lord will raise up that will do what is in his heart and in his soul and he will go in and out before the people. What God is saying is he is going to have the ability, the Spirit of God is going to rest on Samuel and he's going to have the ability to go in God and come out and give a word and go in God and come out. And Samuel brings an entire shift to a generation. Samuel anoints King David who shifts the generation of Israel forever because Jesus comes out of his lineage. And uh, in this time, you know, when Samuel was anointed as king, it says at the end of Judges that there was no king in the land and the people did as they saw fit. If that isn't an accurate description of what's happening in the world right now, that there's no king and people are doing as they saw fit, this is my truth. You can't challenge my truth. Hey, are you guys doing okay? Okay, great. You're just thinking? Great. <laughs> I, feel, I've, I feel fiery today. I feel fiery every day. Because here's the thing. I started ministering after my encounter. And I would see the power of God start touching people. I'd see these amazing outpourings of the Spirit. But every now and again, that voice that I got delivered from would come back and knock on the door and see if we could have a conversation. I want to tell you, some of you got free this week. When you have something that's, that's taking position in your life and you get set free, it's like kicking a vagabond out of your house. It's like you've had someone living in your home, eating your food, sleeping on your couch, using your toilet paper, using up your toothpaste, and they never replace it. It's like children. No, I'm playing, I'm playing, joking, JK. It's like a grown person doing that who should be able to get their own stuff. And you kick him out. But sometimes that guy shows back up. That's what's called a familiar spirit. Each of you have had an assignment against your life since you were young and it comes against the call of God in your life and it is the same voice and it sounds familiar and there's a little bit of comfort in that voice. Hey, you wanna open the door again? Hey, you remember me? Remember how we used to hang out together? We used to have such good times watching TV, sharing popcorn. Do you remember that? And you get the choice. Yeah, I'm gonna let you in and listen to your conversation or I'm gonna go get behind me, Satan. You're a thief and a liar. You have every permission to look at the enemy and say, you're a thief and a liar and all you do is rob from me, get out. But this voice started talking to me and I started saying, Lord, this is what I don't understand. For six weeks, I didn't even hear that voice. What was that? And the Lord said to me, that was remaining in me. You see, in John 15, God doesn't say, let me abide in you and live your life. He says, no, remain in me and I in you. He makes a distinction that there is a difference between having the Lord fill you and you live in God. And the Lord told me that the key for the church in the next 10 years will be the mind of Christ. Let's open to 1 Corinthians 2 real quick. It's verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And when we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but, it, um, but is himself judged by no one. For who understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Read this last, last line with me. But we have the mind of Christ. This passage here is saying that for those who have God's spirit are able to obtain the mind of God. No man can have the mind of God, but the Spirit of God. But we who have received the Spirit now can dwell in the thoughts of Christ. Here is the thing. We are living so much by the flesh 
that we pop in and out of heavenly realities instead of living in the tension of who God is. And I was trying to explain this to my third years uh, about eight months ago. I was, I was having this moment, uh, I don't know how to explain, I was having an encounter while I was preaching and I was talking about how to live in God. And a lot of us, we have experiences where we call on the Holy Spirit, we call on the Lord in times of trouble, but we don't live with our minds dwelling in the things above because we don't want to live in tension. We want to live in understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own. In all ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. You see, we receive the infilling of the Spirit by surrender, but we live in God by where we set our attention and our affection. But because there are things that we cannot grasp about God, we don't wanna embrace them until we understand them. We don't wanna embrace the fear of the Lord and the goodness of God because we don't understand. And we can only live in the tension of these two things by the Spirit. And I explained these to my students. I said, I think it's like a circle. And as I started drawing the circle, I started with an infinity loop. And I just went like this, it's like this. It's like, yes, I am powerful beyond measure and I'm a daughter of God, but I'm only a daughter because of His great mercy. And by His great mercy, He has empowered me to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. But I don't do that by my own volition, but by His great love and His power. For it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit. But by the Spirit, the door to heaven is open in Revelation 4. For me to grab the leaves of healing and I bring it to the earth. And as I do, I remember that it wasn't my hands, but it was His Spirit. And as my hands touch the sick, they recover and they begin to walk and leap and praise the Lord. And in turn, I lay my crown at His feet and I give myself fully to Him again, and as I do, He exalts me, but I do not seek first my own kingdom or righteousness and all things added, but I seek Him. And when I do, all things are added, and I bring myself low so He can take me high up into the heavens. But I am no princess, I am under the rule of a king. But as I do, I become a friend of God, but I remember that I can only go as far in friendship as I do in Lordship. And as I submit myself to His Lordship, He empowers me with great authority. But authority is only carried by submission. Not opportunity for me to puff myself up but lay myself down and as I do, I, I bring keys to cities and I unlock great realities and realms and places in the Lord. But I remember that it's only through His mercy and His grace and as I receive His mercy, I offer myself as a living sacrifice. And He always sets fire on sacrifice. This is the fear of God and the goodness of God. You know, I notice that Jesus is really unafraid of people feeling great around Him. Sometimes I get so offended by how confident, sometimes entitled people get when God first meets them. And then the Lord reminds me his disciples did the same. You see, there's this tension that I believe as we have walked in the revelation of the goodness of God, that we have become a little bit entitled. That we think we can do church without reliance. We think maturity in leadership is independence. When actually the more mature you become, the more dependent you are. And there is a pressure on leaders to know everything. Last night, I watched as Ben Fitz said multiple times, I do not usually minister like this. Do you remember hearing that? I remember hearing Jesus say that he wasn't able to do as many miracles in his hometown. Do you remember that? You see, because to the measure that we are willing to live in the tension of the goodness and the fear of God is to the measure that we'll host an open heaven. And to the measure that we'll host an open heaven is to the measure that we'll see a demonstration of the power of God. There was a great excitement and a deep grief in my heart last night. The excitement was that we can step into a place that we can't go usually. But the grief was, was Lord, why is this so few and far between? You see, the job of our generation isn't to throw out the goodness of God and start preaching a message again about a stoic scary dad. But our job is to hold the tension of a great father 
that rejoices over you with singing and dancing, the Zephaniah 317 God, but a God that also disciplines. You see, this generation is saying that love means that you tolerate, and tolerate means that you agree, but really those two words, we've changed the meanings. The actual definition of tolerance is that we can disagree and we can stay in connection. But instead, we are using manipulative terms to create a place where we, have, we no longer have standards. And the Lord is going to bring back the fear of the Lord into our lives. And the fear of the Lord is the most healthy and wonderful experience that we can have. <laughs> but we have to remain in Him. There's a light bulb that's been on in a fire station for over a hundred years, so it wasn't an LED bulb because they didn't exist then. Do you remember those little light bulbs, a little filament going across? Yeah. I can see a nod. You probably changed a few of those in your life, you know? My dad up there changing up the light bulb, and my dad's a scientist, so he's sitting showing me how it burnt out. There's a light bulb that's never burnt out, and they began to wonder why it hadn't burnt out, and they discovered that it's because it's never been switched off that it's the switching on and off of a light bulb that causes it to burn out. I was sitting with, uh, I don't know if you know The Chosen. I was sitting with one of the uh, senior producers and vice president of content of The Chosen. She's one of my close friends, a wild revivalist, a wild revivalist in the middle of Hollywood bringing the kingdom. She was told to shave a million dollars off of a production budget. The thing is, production budgets are set to, um, to really an industry standard that has been going on for years and years and years and years. This is how you produce a movie. And in the budget, they just, you Christian movie budget, they have to take shave off a million dollars. And my friend Kay is talking to me about how she's, she's having to connect in to the Lord to get a strategy. Well, she ends up shaving a million dollars off of a production budget. And the, the guys, the produce, the guys that are doing the production part, the cameramen and the post-production guys, they come and they're like, this is better than any production budget we've ever seen. And this is actually gonna be more effective and more efficient. And she got it in the glory. <laughs> and as Kay is sharing this to me, I'm gonna share a picture that I saw in the spirit. I saw these, I mean, this is a great picture. Actually, I saw probably just shifted that way. I saw these colored lines in the spirit and they went from a spectrum of colors and along the colored lines, I saw this thick black line and the Lord said to me, the thick black line is the natural. And he said, many of my believers are living in and out of the natural process, but there's this expanse of the kingdom in the spirit that I want them to experience. And he began to show me what they do is they're like, okay, so I'm at church on a Sunday and I love God and it's wonderful. And then I hit reality on Sunday afternoon where I have a fight with my husband. And then I wonder if we're gonna make it. And then I go into the depths of God and I seek his face. And then my kid cusses at me and I feel horrible. And then I, I, I look at my bank account and it's, it's dwindling. And then I go to the Lord and I'm begging him for breakthrough and then I touch back down and I start freaking out because I don't know how we're gonna make it again and then I try and I go read my Bible to go see what he wants to say does he want to rescue me does he want to help me and then I hit this next point where it's like but my work's hard and my job's my job's sad or I get a bad diagnosis and listen I want to tell you that's real life but the Lord said to me this I began to see this infinity sign going across the multi-dimensional nature of God. And he said, but if you will live in the tension of me, instead of living from heaven to earth, earth to heaven like this, if you will just live in me in the tension of my greatness and my glory and not question my ways, but trust me in all your ways. If you will step in to signs, wonders and miracles, but rely on me in humility. If you will hold this tension of who I am, you will begin to live a life outside of just the natural. And instead you'll be grabbing trees from the leaves in heaven and you'll be bringing them to earth. And when you touch earth, you'll be bringing breakthrough and then diving into my depths as you lay yourself down in submission. Are you hearing me, church? There is a place in God that we can live. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says that he longs to be outside of this tent. He said, not for the tent to be removed, but to be further clothed in his heavenly tent. Paul was so living in the spirit that he couldn't have no, um, no oppression no incarceration, no persecution could shift Paul's mindset, not because Paul was unique, but because Paul had realized God didn't just want to live in him, but he was called to live in God. 
You see, it doesn't mean that real life circumstances don't face us. It just means that I live with a spiritual reality, an eternal reality. I don't live by the flesh. I live by the spirit. And the Spirit says that my God is mighty. The Spirit says that no matter what the outcome, that I have an eternal home in heaven, I never die. You never die. You do not have to fear death. You do not have to fear hardship. Do you know why? Because this life is a breath, but this life matters. <laughs> the willingness to live in tension is to live a life where you feel a little uncomfortable. Paul says he longed to get clothed. Why? Because the tension sometimes gets you to a place where you wonder, do I want to keep doing this? I, I want to be real with you today. There are moments where I feel so provoked that I wonder if I belong. There are moments where I sit in a church of revival who loves the Lord and I feel like I'm going to combust any moment if I do not have more of God. And sometimes I look around and I wonder, is anybody gonna be with me? Sometimes I feel so drawn into God that I feel like I might completely lose myself. The, the woman you see up here preaching with conviction and fire, spent so much time trying to become small and less because I'm not sure that I will fit in if I get any wilder. <laughs> there are some days that I just weep because I'm hungry. There are days where I have to manage this ferocity inside of me that wants more of him than I know is available. There is a cost to this life. And my greatest pain is, are we willing to pay it? You leave this room today. You leave this atmosphere today. This atmosphere wasn't created through ease. And I can guarantee you, Pastor Corey and Pastor Simone will have moments that will be really challenging. The enemy hates people. When, when the enemy went after little boys, when Herod started to kill little boys, he didn't know where it was coming from. He didn't know where the root of Jesse was springing up from. So you know what? He went after all of them. The enemy is terrified of a church. Now the Spirit of God is not gonna rest on one, but on many. And he is terrified of a church that wants to dwell in the mind of Christ. Could I have um, the keys player up? And Caleb, could you grab a mic? I'm so sorry, Pastor Corey, can I have a little bit more time? Okay, I won't take a ton. I just wanna finish this up. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, I just took my earring out. I'm not trying to get you excited. I couldn't think of anything worse than preaching a good message and people thinking, oh, she's great. She's fiery, she's intense, she's cool. Maybe not cool, maybe just weird. <laughs> my, my prayer is that these words carry spirit and life. My prayer is that if you can't catch half of it, that it begins to blast in you and excavate space in you to hunger. Because you're not gonna find this in a message, you're gonna find this in seeking. The message is there to provoke, the encounter is there to provoke people who will seek, ask and knock. People who will pursue, people who will hold tension. 
And I tell you what, the lie of the enemy is that you will be alone. But the truth is that there are hundreds, thousands around who are looking for one who will burn so they can join them. The enemy would tell me, you'll be alone. No one will get you. You'll lose yourself. But the truth is, I will lose myself in God. And there are hundreds of people just waiting for someone to say, I will do it. No matter what the critique is, no matter what the criticism is, I am living for a life beyond this moment. I am living for a generation I will not see. And there is a king of glory. And let me tell you, you cannot do this by your effort. You have to do it by the Spirit. Because the Spirit will awaken you to eternal things. And it is only a life with awareness of eternity that knows how to make hard choices in the moment. Because eternity defines our choice. There is a great cloud of witnesses. Hebrews 12 says that cheer us on. Those people were sawn in half, crucified upside down, boiled in oil. And it says that they will not enter into their inheritance apart from us. <laughs> the apostles, the martyrs, the revivalists will not enter into their inheritance apart from your life. Psalm 18.10, Proverbs 18.10, excuse me, says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. In the natural, a name is just a, a letter. It's just something written on a piece of paper that you wave over your head like a banner. But in the spirit, the name of the Lord is multidimensional. In the spirit, the name of the Lord becomes a fortress that you can run into. Jehovah Rapha, the healer, Yahweh, the breath of life, Jehovah Elohim, your great comfort. In, in, in the spirit, the name of God becomes multidimensional. It says those who are in Christ are more than conquerors. Why? Because in Christ, in the spirit, the name of Jesus becomes multidimensional and you become victorious standing in the middle of his name. In Christ, you are a new creation. Sometimes in the natural, I don't feel like a new creation, but in the spirit, when I step into who Jesus is, what happens is I realize I am not as though I was. He is making me, molding me, forming me. I feel like I need to share this with you. It's quite vulnerable for me. My second child, her name's Liberty June. Uh, when she was born, we had a lot of prophetic words about her being a worship leader in my womb, people having dreams. It was the, the child that we had the most prophetic words over. People having dreams, left, right, and center, all congruent with leadership and worship. When Liberty was born, she came in the water sack, it never broke, and as she was birthed, she punched through it like a little victorious girl that she is. But a few minutes into Liberty being on my chest, the room got totally silent. And the doctor sat down with me and let me know that my daughter seemed to have Down syndrome. Now, a lot of people have preconceived ideas of what that would mean, and I just wanna tell you first and foremost that liberty is perfect to me. That I don't share this because I need liberty to change, to love her more. In fact, liberty gave me a revelation of the Father's love for me because I realized there was nothing in me that needed liberty to change, to love her more. I loved her wholly and completely if she never hit one milestone in her life. But my job as a mother was to see liberty become the fullness of who God is. You see, I share this because I don't live a perfect life. Every IEP meeting, which is an education plan, people tell me what my daughter can't do. Every time I mix with other children, I see the places that this chromosomal uh, abnormality has caused my daughter to have to fight harder than most kids have to. And you know, when we're home, we're kind of hidden in this bubble. But I wanna tell you, when those, those education teachers sit down and tell me what my daughter is not doing, I'm not living on the natural life. In the natural, I need to do something about it. I need to try harder, I need to work harder, I need to be better. But in the spirit, I have a God that I can trust in. And when Liberty was seven days old, I was on the keys by myself. And I was weeping because I saw the angels and the Father. I, he took me back to the room where she was born and they were waiting in anticipation for her. And I began to weep because I said, God, I wasn't waiting for her. I felt like I was waiting for something else. 
And I felt so sad in my heart that I didn't know. I said, God, I didn't know how to wait for her. And you were waiting and I wish I was waiting. And the Lord said to me, come, we're still waiting. He said, I'm still doing a great work. I want you to come up here. I want you to come up, Colossians 1, Jesus Christ is seated in heavenly places above every power, every principality, every rule. And there it says in Colossians 3, you are hidden with Christ. And every time I sit in those IEP meetings, guess what? I go and hide in God. And I go stand up with the angels and the Father. And I wait. I'm not waiting for a breakthrough because I need my daughter to be more more beautiful or more powerful or more educated. I don't care about that. She is gorgeous, just so you know. She'll be a model one day, I'll tell you. I wait up there because I know that no matter what she's not, I know who God is for her. And I know that that girl one day will lead worship. She runs up on a stage and she gets on a microphone and she goes for it every time. But here's the thing, if I live in the natural, I feel pressure. But if I live hidden in Christ, liberty's life is powerful and supernatural if nothing changes. This moment in our life is going to grow us as a family. It's gonna grow her as a woman of God. I share this because there are things in your life, sometimes we preach these powerful messages and they think, yeah, but you don't know what I'm living. My father-in-law died of cancer while I contended for him for, for a year and a half laid my hand on his chest and prayed for his resurrection. As I saw a vision of heaven, him walking away with Jesus. Like I'm not standing here telling you a message. I've been in resurrections. I've laid hands on babies and adults. I've, I've, I've put the, the, the message into practice and I've seen loss and I've seen victory, but I'm not living for an outcome. I'm living for one thing. I'm living to see Jesus get his glory. And no loss is going to rob me from my seated place in Jesus. Every assignment is an opportunity for me to hide in Him and say, this is who I am because this is who you are. Are you with me, church? Let's stand together. Can I have um, just someone from the team come and lay? Hannah, will you come and Ali just come lay hands on this couple right here? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Let your presence come. We cannot afford to live with our mindset set on this world. The thief wants to steal, kill, and destroy, but in Christ is life and life in abundance.